Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Adobe Presents DNA D Awards session. We're joined today by Fura Yuanes Dotir. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Um, <laughs> doing an okay job so far. <laughs> um, who's jury member for the category Digital Design. Uh, Fura is joining us from Reykjavik today. Um, and I think we should start diving into your background straight away um, because you have so much to bring to the session today. And we already had a little bit of a, of a prep um chatting through some really interesting topics um at the moment how's everything from your end it's great thank you you know just arrived in Reykjavik yesterday yes did flight during Flying. COVID which was like an adventure and uh I'm here safe <laughs> that's <laughs> the most important <laughs> yeah. so you were coming back from London if I'm not wrong yeah yeah yeah, yeah. made it made it safely to back to Iceland which is where you're from correct yeah that's true so, based in Reykjavik, with a background in digital, um, obviously your experience um, you're bringing into uh, DNAD is as Chief Design Officer at HUGE. Um, if you can tell us a bit more about your background and introduce yourself for the session. Oh, wow. Well, I've been doing this for 20 years, which is interesting. So, you know, I got a job in 2000, which was in digital, and it was new. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I have literally been doing it for 20 years across the globe. I have lived in New York and worked across the US. I have lived in Stockholm and worked in Europe. I have lived in London and worked in the Middle East. Um, and, and now I'm back in London, but uh, working at HUGE with a global role as a chief uh, design officer, uh, which is super exciting. And what's been interesting about this journey, first of all, going between cultures, but also being in an industry that was in the beginning stages in the 2000s and be a part of kind of, I would say, defining it and trying to figure out how it plays a role in our lives. So it's been it's been quite a journey. It's great. Seeing exactly the kind of development of digital throughout your career probably so far. And um, it's really great to see that you were a part of it and, and kicking off something that is, I think, has always been a debate. Right. And we're still seeing conversation around this and um the quality of digital design which is something we'll touch on today i'm sure um very quickly but you described yourself i caught this somewhere online as a visionary who obsesses about the future which i yes. find a really nice way to talk about um the the way you're driven um and what you see in terms of you know innovation in the industry um can you tell us a bit more about what's kind of kept your career going um and inspired in general yeah, I think when you um, work in this industry, it's moving so fast and it's actually, you know, hard to keep up with it. Yeah. Uh, and digital is, is the driver and change is happening faster and faster. And I think, you know, when we're working with our clients, we need to be, be in the forefront of tech and what that is going to do in terms of changing human behavior, because that's really what technology does. It changes the way you behave and how you interact. You know, and sometimes it's a negative, but sometimes it's a positive. Uh, so we want, really want to try for positive change, right? Yeah. And um, so, you know, that's kind of how I think about it being future obsessed, because you have to kind of see what's around the corner. And when a new technology launches into the world, how that's going to affect people's lives and how companies and brands uh, need to respond to that, to be a part of the dialogue and be a, being a part of people's lives. So. You know, it's uh, it's definitely a full time job just to kind of focus on that. Um, but I, I consider that to be my job to help companies thrive in what comes, you know, what is what's going to be next. And have you had any kind of career highlights in terms of some of the clients you worked with and projects that have really stood out as, you know, representative of what you, you know, what your mission is? Um, well, you know, it's it's. Uh, my my kickoff in my career was at RGA, really in New York. Uh, I feel like that's when it started to happen, and mm -hmm. and in two thousand and five, and I was lucky enough um, to be put on the Nike account. And one of the first projects I did there was an interactive uh, um, video with Rihanna, where she would perform the song, and and you would be able to learn the moves. So jump in the timeline. And it was very complicated back then to do that type of, of, of work. And I think a lot of, uh, I think that was definitely something that I felt very proud of early on in my career. But 
I mean, a lot of the work I did with Nike as a client um, uh, stands out. I mean, I redesigned Nike.com twice, so I uh, did a lot the of work. The first time wasn't quite enough. <laughs> well, you know, things get updated. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, it's good. Uh, so <laughs> I think, um, yeah, a lot of the work has just been around helping navigate. And I think one of the things that I was very excited about back in the days was also to think about you know, how physical and digital comes together and what's the ro role of digital in physical spaces. So I did some work on that uh, with various clients, like, you know, uh, Nike was definitely one of them. So yeah, I heard art installations were also something that you were experimenting with and in, in installations in general. Um, so it wasn't only this kind of digital space as we think about it. And I think even before we start, we should also define what digital design is, because that's something that will be, you know, important for the launching in the digital space. Um, I saw that Asahi was launching a, a beer um, uh, kind of online shopping platform. So retail is being reshaped at the moment, yeah. which I'm, I would be really interesting to hear your thoughts on. Um, I think the platform is called Beer Pronto. So, you know, there's a whole kind of um, new ecosystem being very quickly created mm -hmm. right now as well, responding to the current situation. What are yeah. your thoughts on this and um, the, the movement of, as you said, the pace of it? Uh, I, I mean, What's interesting about COVID uh, and what happened is I feel like the situation has accelerated some of the things that were around the corner and should have actually have happened already. Because it's been kind of interesting to see how companies have been slow to digital, um, you know, going on digital platforms. And, and I think it's really accelerated that need and, and but what you're describing, which is really interesting, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, is like, yeah. you're really talking about brands going direct to consumer, yeah. you know? Smaller brands, very small brands going in and doing it. And, and to me, that is definitely a trend that's on the rise. You know, I, I do this myself. When I'm gonna buy a shampoo, I don't really go to a giant like Amazon, I go and buy it buy direct, you know? And, because I want to support those businesses in the best ways that I can. And I believe that perhaps their margin is going to be better if I do it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's really accelerated a lot of the stuff, not only, um, you know, people going into e-commerce to sell stuff, uh, but also just the way we live. And I think, um, you know, video conferencing has been available for a long time. 
we were still going on the planes to go into meetings, even though it would just be like one or two hour meetings that we needed to attend because we thought that meeting was that important, right? And it's this acceleration and this, this is like a forcing us to change. And I think in many ways change to the better. And do you feel that these smaller companies are able to react to change a little bit quicker? Um, you know, because like even my my experience working in agency, you know, and, and I, being in FMCG especially, you know, I found this real clash of understanding um, in, right, okay, digital needs to happen. And there's been this big buzzword for so long, like you said, being in the industry. and But it tends to be this very superficial level of, all right, we accept this. But then when it comes to, you know, you know, implementing processes and innovating, then there wasn't much room for growth. Do you feel that these smaller companies have the pace and maybe the 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 mindset to respond to situations like COVID? Smaller companies or companies in general? Or smaller brands. Yeah, smaller yeah. Brands, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think small brands in some way might be more nimble and might be able yeah. to do it faster. I, I, I do think, you know, some of the big companies, um, big retailers, for example, that didn't do it fast enough and have been looking at Amazon for a long time, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. but still didn't put the money and the effort into doing it. They're the ones who are going to be in trouble now, you know, and, and because it, when you are at a certain size and what happens, like what happened right now is, is, you know, you collapse really fast, you know, when yeah. the door to your store closes, I mean, that's scary. But I think it's been really interesting. I mean, I've been walking around London and seeing how, you know, smaller companies are kind of responding to this. Yeah. I think we've been quite creative, you know, yeah. home delivery services, restaurants starting to sell groceries, you yeah. know, and I'm like, you know, there is definitely, and I think people are going to those places to buy because they want to make sure that those places kind of stick around and be open when we're over, over this hub. <laughs> And do you feel that it's, um, you know, what is slowing down some brands from jumping onto this? Because a conversation that we'll have is quality. So something that you said a couple of days back was that digital design is, is being democratized at a really low quality uh, in terms of expectation, or especially from your end, you were saying that, you know, not only in the category that we'll talk about, but also around you, you're seeing that um, it's maybe not what you expect from a lot of brands and companies. Yeah. I think it's been really interesting uh, to to think about that and kind of what's what's been happening, um, because um, there is this ter uh, term about you know service design and agile design, which I am totally for, mm -hmm. um, that has been around for a long time, and it's really about you know. Uh, making sure that the product is working and optimizing for customer journeys. But um, sometimes I think, and when you want to do that right, you have to work at speed, right? You have to do things really fast. But working fast doesn't mean that the design needs to suffer. It's just a matter of prioritization. And what I see in a lot of the product is the sea of sameness. And it kind of drives me nuts that every single banking app that I open up looks the same and none of them is good. You know, and I'm like, why have we just been okay with things becoming mediocre in many ways bad? Um, and even just the pure design of it isn't good. I understand that sometimes the systems are slow and it takes time to fix the backends, but it doesn't mean that you can't do smart things on, on, on the user interface level that's going to make it more engaging and a better customer experience. So it's like, oh, yeah, this bank is doing that. Let's all do it. I'm like, but it's not good, you know? So I'm just, and I think this, I don't know why this is happening, you know, but like, yeah, it's like, oh, the design doesn't matter. Yes, it does actually matter a lot, you know? And I, I think, you know, one of the things that as designers, we, we are the people who are going to be inventing the next and we should be pushing the boundaries and creating the next patterns. And, and uh, you know, so that's, that's what we do. And, and and like specifically within agencies, I think that what we try to do, but the world is full of really mediocre to bad design, and it makes me sad. 
<laughs> yeah, it's really interesting that you talk about competition that, you know, one bank might be looking at what the other industry, the rest of the industry is doing out there, but actually should they instead be usually just looking at their audience and the consumer and the users who use their products every day and thinking, actually, what, what are we not doing and how do they experience our products and, and digital every day, as opposed to looking at what the rest of the industry is, is yeah. doing poorly. <laughs> I think I think I actually do talk to the audiences um, and and their customers sometimes and often actually, mm. uh, but I do think they need to look outside of their own sector to get yeah. the innovation and get the ideas from and yeah. think about like how can I borrow thinking from another industry and inject that into my own industry to accelerate what we do for our customers because I don't think people. Don't, they don't know what they need until they have seen it. This so they're Steve Jobs' like, um, exactly. famous line, right? <laughs> like their benchmark is what they already yeah. know. Uh, yeah. But and I think that's the role of the designers is to push it to the next level and show people yeah. what they need next. You yeah. know. And I think maybe COVID has also added, obviously, another layer of complexity where now it's not only just quality, but rethinking completely how you know what people actually need and. Um, um, you know, what business models, even some companies are using. So yeah. if we see the pressure on retail, that's suddenly shifting everything that you used to do um, and the way you use technology. Yeah, I, I think that's actually the, the exciting part, you know, yeah. like, because I'm weirdly, like, kind of optimistic about this. I mean, this is a sad thing and, it, 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 and it's like, it's an epic, yeah, it's awful. But like, at the same time, I'm a little bit like, maybe something good is going to come out of this, you know? And, and like you say, like, it forces us to think differently. And I think it's really healthy for everybody to try to think differently and innovate and think about how can we rethink what we have been doing for the past, you know, 100 years or 70 years, or for that matter, for digital for 20 years. And can we talk as well, I think, as you said, we're rethinking. So what is the future? What do you think is an emerging trend? And we'll go into the category as well. But, you know, what are some kind of trends that you're seeing in digital design? And since this is also what you specialize in. Wow. So mm -hmm. you would have asked me pre-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do both scenarios. <laughs> uh, I would have said that emerging experiencing experiences and the merge of physical and digital is on the rise. Mm -hmm. So, and I could, I, I could see it when we're judging that there is this idea of experiential uh, in digital design, which is, has to do with, you know, retail spaces, how you rethink them and, and museums and like just, you know, airports, everything like, that has really been on the rise. And, and that's the area that I've been probably most excited about because that's when we start engaging in digital in a more seamless way where the, the screen is gonna go away. And that's, that's the thing that I'm very excited about. Like what happens when the screen goes away? That being said, it's been a lot of touch screens integrated in those kinds of experiences. And so I think we need to think about like, okay, well, how does voice then play a role? So I think we need to rethink that a little bit and then the other thing that I, I am excited about is uh, and it was another trend actually when we're judging is um, the use of data in design and how you can actually use data to create you know new exciting experiences and and use data to you know change behavior in the end of the day and then obviously AI is, is around the corner and and you know and the quality of data when we start doing artificial intelligence is going to be key. And we can't use historic data necessarily because historic um, data has bias built into it. Um, you know, historic, you know, systematic bias, which is also really relevant in today's world. And I think we need to be careful when we go into AI. I think it's going to be very positive if it manages to get the bias out of the system. Um, and it's going to help us, you know, move hopefully into a more positive world where we're going to be more diverse and more equal. It's really interesting that you also obviously mentioned the pre and post COVID or we're not even talking about post COVID yet, but we're really right in the middle of it. Um, but something you mentioned as well is that some industries will have a little bit more pressure to produce digital design and rethink their business model. And one of them being travel, for example. Um, you know, are you seeing this kind of uneven um, demand across some of your clients or the, you know, industries that are out there and um, that will bring us as well to the category and the different um, brands that have submitted work? 
Yeah, I think I think there is a lot of clients going commerce, <laughs> you know, yeah. going direct to consumers. Um, so I could see that the consumer brands are gonna like put more emphasis on that uh, post COVID uh, because they need to, because they were actually relying on third party retailers like big um, department stores that are not open right now. Um, so I think, you know, that's definitely gonna be a big change moving forward. Uh, the airlines, um, I think there are industries that need to kind of go really deep and really th rethink and, and like, yeah. And I think travel might just change in general. Like, and like, are we gonna be going as often? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Have we kind of realized that it's okay to stay home and, you know, taking vacation doesn't mean that you have to go onto a plane and go to a different destination specifically if you wanna be, you know, driving for a better planet, right? Because we have, to, yeah. I think, Perhaps if we're not gonna go back to the office like we used to do, like maybe there's gonna be more of people traveling to work and being able to be in a location over a long time of period of time and work remotely. I don't know. I think I think the opportunities are endless. Uh, yeah. But I do think you're right. Like the travel industry needs to rethink their business models and really rethink, you know, what they're gonna do nice next, and you know, what is the role of an airline, right? Is it more than just an airline? Is it something else? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the environment as well because this is one of the projects that you you picked from the category it does talk about um, you know carbon emissions. So we'll, yeah. we'll cover that a little bit later. Yeah. We actually have a question from the chat, and we haven't even mentioned this, but uh, you know everyone watching, please ask away questions as well for Fura. Um, but Johanna uh, was asking, um, what do you see as being the main role and responsibility of digital design, especially now when we are relying so much on it? Oof, <laughs> big question. <laughs> no, it is everything. I, I think yeah. it's. I think it's really interesting because, um, let's talk about brand and brand design, right? Mm -hmm. uh, brand design traditionally is done, you know, very kind of uh, top down, like, um, and it, it doesn't really happen quickly. Um, but I think there's gonna be a rise of brand design happening in digital medium first. There, is, there are designers in the world that do that and do it really well and accelerate uh, you know, a new value proposition and product development by doing that. So if you wanna talk about digital design, I think digital has been forgotten about sometimes and think people think about brand and brand design uh, and it has been secondary for a long time. You know, I, I don't know how many brand guidelines I've seen that have nothing about digital, nothing, zero. Uh, you know, and that's kind of shift. Um, so, you know, in my mind, digital design is, is hopefully going to be the entry point into design. And like, that's where we're going to, it's going to be the starting point. And then we kind of design from the bottom up. And that's the, that's the stuff that gets me really excited. And I'm actually hoping that when we do that, perhaps the quality of design overall is going to go up again, specifically in the digital medium, because I, I, we as designers need to be responsible for that and make sure that it is the top notch design that the world should be getting. Um, digital design is also powerful because you can use data and you can, you know, personalize stuff based on data. Uh, we haven't cracked it yet. There's not a lot of experiences that do that well. And digital design can help you change your behavior uh, if you want to, which is why I, I love the, the do black. It's about behavioral change. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Uh, should we talk a bit more about the category as well? I think that leads nicely into it. So um, your kind of experience, you know, tell us a bit more about the process and um, you know, some of the work that's been submitted. Um, we can then deep dive into the videos that you wanted to share. Yeah, yeah. Well, the process is, I love judging, by the way. I mean, I think uh, what's, what's really great about it is that you get to see all the work from across the globe. And, and uh, it gives you a really good perspective of what's happening in our world. Um, and we judge first home uh, at home on our own. Uh, and uh, we spend hours on the video and we basically vote things in or out um, in memes that we think it's award worth 
worthy. Um, and then usually what used to happen pre-COVID, you would meet your jury in, in a room and judge um, together. So usually how it happens is that you take the first day, first couple of days, and you do judging on your own on the, by the, on the computer, and then we debate the work. And the debate is actually really what decides where you're going to be placed. And, and it's really good to debate it because honestly, work that you never considered when you have hear someone else's perspective, you actually might pull it in, you know, or there are cases where you can actually bring work back that you feel like didn't make it to the list and you can bring it back. And there was definitely a case that was put back in the digital design. Um, uh, and, you know, and it's, it's just, it's really good because you, you dive into it. You just dive into it. And, and, and some award shows have started to do the dialogue and open up the dialogue a little bit more to, to allow audiences to look, look at what actually happens behind the scenes. Because I don't think people realize how much work goes into judging and how serious we are about just putting the best. I mean, the DNAD is one of the hardest awards to, look, to look, win on the planet. And quality is front and center. Quality, quality, quality. And, you know, uh, I don't think we gave, a, gave a, even a yellow pencil this year. You know? Oh, really? In this, so, so, wow. If I, if, I, if I think we didn't. Um, so, um, because the barrier is high. And what would have made a yellow pencil, in your opinion, and that didn't quite make it? And I think you talked a little bit um, during our call about experimentation. Do you feel that this is something that was missing from the category, or what kind of or, or experimentation and kind of innovation? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. Um, um, I think it comes back to um, I think there are so many things you have to have to to get a like an award. I think you need to be uh, you know, forward thinking, you need to be kind of, I think you need to be kind of showing what's coming next yeah. uh, in many ways or, uh, or be on the forefront of design. Um, I think you need to be like, um, quality obviously needs to be front and center. Um, and it needs to be real, you know? And, and I, I think sometimes some of the best work is, is, is data you know, something that's in the world, but at like a really low scale. And we did, for example, debate that, you know, yeah. how big does the audience have to be for, for, for you to get up? Um, and we felt like you needed to be real to get a yellow. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of debate around that and, and which is healthy debate. And, and also like digging into the work and just being like, okay, did this really happen? Or is this just a beautiful case study? Really interesting way of putting it. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel this that brought some tension to the conversation, or was there any project that was particularly, or work that was particularly, um, you know, intense for uh, anyone to bring up? It was a really. We were a really nice. I think we were a really nice jury, and and uh, <laughs> you know, everyone says this for all the categories. That's great. No, but, but <laughs> to hear. Yeah. But, uh, there was a thing that we did debate, um, which was, what's digital. Okay. Uh, so there is, uh, I think, a case in there that was Spotify uh, canvas that I put forward because we did debate if that was digital enough, right. you know, and is it digital design enough? That was the debate. And because it's a beautiful case, it's a pop up in Austin. It's re it's re <laughs> it's real. It happened, you know, yeah. and. But I was one of the people that I really, I really liked that because it was a multi-sensory experience. And, and, and my point was like, I don't think we can think about digital in, in isolation with the whole world. And if someone actually thought about how, you know, <laughs> how this experience is gonna come to life through the mix of digital and physical things, I think there were like, cocktails in the mix that matched an album and you know I, I mean they really fought through it and and I think that's important work I think that's the work that's going to show the world you know how for example the 
the future of retail could look like. You know, yes, it's a pop-up in Austin and, and it has more elements than only digital, but what that's actually the beauty of it. It's the holistic view of all everything coming together that makes it great work. Mm -hmm. And Spotify, so to give everyone at home, we're going to be showing, I think this is a perfect time to show the video, but, um, you know, the, the, the work was um, pitched as a record store reimagined um, called Canvas. And as you said, interactivity was a huge part of um, the experience of it uh, with some design sleeves. Um, so let's perhaps put the video, Alex, if you uh, can get out there and we'll talk a bit afterwards. For most of its history, recorded music was a physical experience. Art serving sound, helping listeners build an emotional connection with music. But today, the album cover has shrunk to an afterthought, a casualty of the digital age. And the architects of streaming wanted to change that. In 2019, Spotify introduced a new format called Canvas, full motion, looping video that can be added to any track on the platform. To celebrate a truly new medium for artistic expression, we partnered with Spotify to reimagine the power of album art. Introducing Canvas Records, a pop-up record store in a town famous for its music, Austin, Texas. A space inspired by the retro visuals of the golden age of vinyl, updated for the modern age. Inside, guests browse shelves full of moving album covers, Custom crafted sleeves created to house looping canvas videos. Each piece was designed to complement its canvas using a variety of design techniques. Hand illustration, vector art, collage, abstract design, and photography. Each was printed at standard 12 by 12 inch LP size on the exact same wax coated cardstock that record junkies have been handling for decades. Consumers were asked to find their favorite canvas, scan to listen, then take it up to our special listening bar to drink a custom cocktail inspired by their choice. We transformed the entire space around the albums too. Dozens of custom posters and flyers covered the walls, each paying tribute to a genre of music, disguising brand messaging as record store ephemera, record totes with retro-inspired screen printing, and a custom-designed and fabricated neon sign greeting guests at the entrance. It was clear, when you immerse the music industry in creativity, your art has the power to move. All right, so everyone had a bit of a taster of uh, this uh, project that was submitted. So which award did they receive um, for Canvas? Oh God, I'm so oh, bad. Am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, it's a really great. Uh, it was experiential. Uh, it was yeah. one of the categories within experiential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's something really interesting about this one because I think, as you said, digital can be um, kind of implemented or activated quite poorly where it's yeah. kind of just clogging up the whole user journey and, and experience. But, you know, done right, I think digital can really elevate experiences. Um, so, you know, this is about kind of value creation. So what was the value in terms of, you know, Spotify activating this or was it just uh, for the sake of, uh, you know, having something fun and playful? Um, so, yeah, tell us more about what uh, what brought you to this um, project specifically and, and why you, you picked it up. <laughs> First of all, I, I just like the experimentation, right? Yeah. You know, record store of the future. Let's try to reimagine re what it is. Let's bring it to life. Let's invite people in. Let's think about it, how it's holistically going to come to life. Because it's, set, it's, it's sending a sign was important to me. I was like, it's, it's, it's a signal towards what music stores of the future could potentially do or how they could look like. Um, so that was one thing. I also think they were launching um, something uh, online, like in their product. Um, around uh, music and music albums and um it didn't really it was not a tight color this is the work that the jury does we're like okay what was really behind it did they do anything in the product that kind of types back into it because that was that was the that was the debate right and 
And we found out that they were they did work in their product, but it was never like really tight. Like it wasn't clear in the case if that was a relationship between those things. Uh, so that was the debate that we did have. Um, and uh, it was a really healthy debate, uh, but just it's it's the reimagining like the music album and thinking about what it is in digital space. And I, I mean, it was just a lovely, lovely, it was a lovely piece of work, you know. And I really like the um, mission, the art has power to move because it goes back to what you're saying about um, being sensory and uh, maybe yeah. a bit more, um, you know, I think the back as a, a marketing student, I remember these, um, you know, uh, statements of, you know, experiential is visceral and there's something more visceral about um, this. And especially I think the, the other project that you picked up, which is Most Dangerous Street, which definitely taps into this kind of very visceral and deep, um, you know, feeling, um, which brings you kind of digital is not only this distant uh, artificial space, but it's also quite real. Um, it's very real. So, yeah. If, if you apply it right, I think it can be really real. Yeah. Yeah. And can we talk a bit more about data as well? I know this is something that you mentioned earlier on, um, so, you know, that, that brings to mind in terms of, you know, how do you, what do you see the piece, the data piece, and how do you see it as relevant to driving digital design and, and understanding this kind of um, these activations and, and different, uh, was that something that came up in the category or in the discussions you had? Yeah, I think, I mean, as a designer, <laughs> you know, yeah. data is very important. And like, because the data is actually the input into your design process and, and your insights and into like, how you find the value prop, you know, how you define yeah. the value proposition between brands and customers is actually a data-driven process, you know? And, and um, so if you want to make something that's super relevant and something that's going to stand out, I think you have to begin on the data front, which is what we do, which we begin on the data front. And then, you know, um, and then as if you think about it as a design and how you maintain a product, it's all about data, you know, reading data to optimize and reading data to make sure that it's better and reading data to make sure that it's not failing. But I think the most powerful use of data, I think is in the, the I think we have two cases left, um, mm -hmm. is when you use data to help drive behavior change, you know, that to me is very powerful. Like, and, and, and that has been done like within like, you know, running apps and like all kinds of workout apps. And there's a ton of stuff out there in the world that helps you track and change your behavior. Um, and then the other way is to use data, like the other case ha has, to illustrate like the size of an issue or how serious the issue is. And bring and use that data to unlock the emotional story too, you know. And I think when you manage to use data to create emotion, it becomes very powerful. And and I think you know, being able to do that is actually a, surprisingly hard, you know. Yeah. And 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 I think you know the two other cases, which is and this is actually like one of the trends, like I said in the beginning, that came out of the category, was just like how much more case studies we had around data and and work and how good it was so many like same with the experiential it was a strong category the stuff that's next and that's the thing that's interesting to me i'm like when we all live with our you know apps and with our screens all day long why are we doing so putting so little emphasis on making that great while we do so many great things with, with data and experiential. It's just interesting. I think it's an interesting yeah, thought. And I, I like that you talk about behavior change because this is also about um, you know, um, setting some objectives to why we're you know, changing digital design within it and you know, whether it is an agency or a brand. So you know, what is the objective of a certain campaign or a project and uh, what actions are you looking the user to take as a, as a result of this experience? Um, and do you feel this was a specific theme or what themes were in this category and what themes were missing from the category this year? Data and experiential was themes to me. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like it came up. Um, I was a little bit, I think what was perhaps lacking um, was gaming was surprisingly like it's not a lot of like, like 
that's definitely if people want to push gaming and how you think about gaming and digital design i think that's definitely a rich category to go after there were some really interesting things in it but like that was something that we're a little bit like oh okay that's interesting right that we don't have more in that um and then going back to this idea i think service design and and, and is is a difficult one to judge and some of the product like product design um because um how do you judge a product that's been in the market for 10 years and has been updated and made better right that like that's one question you know i don't have an answer but it's a question right how do you judge big service design projects that have are smart and are in some ways you know creating new value propositions in a marketplace but the quality of the execution is is not good enough like how do you judge that right or is it okay to go out with a beta that's how you know i don't know like that's that's the other thing i think I always ask for the quality, right? And and so and and that was kind of my point earlier. You know, sometimes when people get when the case become becomes too much about the process and not necessarily enough about the outcome and what was actually created, it became it became really hard to judge it. And those are usually the things that fall off the list because it's like, well, okay, what was actually created, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then there is always always things that are like you know uh, kind of come up as themes. Like it's a lot of things coming up around making products for people who can't see or can't hear. You know, the the deaf and the blind. And like so, like there's this like product for good. Um, it's definitely on the rise, and I feel like that's been a pattern for the past few years. Is you know it's this pressure on brands to do something that's good for the, for the you know, it's striving for a better world and a, and a better future. And that's definitely the work that's rising to the top. You know, the pure marketing stuff is having a hard time coming through unless it drives to a better something. Yeah, I think with the conversations happening in the world right now, there's definitely a little bit more pressure as well on brands to engage. And I think this is something that we talked about in the impact category um, quite a lot in terms of, you know, it's funny how this is also kind of branching out to everything that we do now. And this idea of, yeah, doing something good and caring and, you know, consumers being more and more demanding on what brands are doing is quite an interesting topic. Yeah, um, I, think, I think how a brand behaves is, yeah. is, is what they're being measured by. And, yeah. and um, so that's interesting. It's a, it's a lot of pressure just coming from uh, the consumer, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. And should we talk about the do, is it do economy? Um, is that how you pronounce yeah, it? The black. next project? Yeah, yeah. do black. So talking about doing things for, yeah. for a better world. Um, yeah. So I love this work. It's probably one of my favorite pieces of work. In I the loved past. it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, the reason I love it is because this is a bank. Let's start there because I've, like mm -hmm. a lot of banks are just doing the same stuff. This is a bank that launched a credit card that's about measuring your carbon footprint for you to be able to see how your purchases, this purchasing decisions impact the world. And then you can set, and there's a limit. So when you hit the limit, the card starts working, right? And I know because that's one. This is actually a, ca a case that we did debate. Going back to this idea, mm -hmm. of debate, because we debated, <clears throat> we debated it because we were like, okay, is this actually a card that's out in the marketplace? I think that was the first thing. And is the data good enough, right? So we dug into it a little bit. Like one of the jury members dug into where did the data come from? Data was really, really, really good. Like they used real data. Like <clears throat> so. So the data was legit. And I think this is a sign, like another product that's like a sign to the power of banks, for example, if they decide to take steps that are about helping people change behavior, um, they can actually kind of start rethinking how they do a lot of those things. And, and to seeing that this bank took the step and actually did it, this cart is in beta. There are people using it. It hasn't been launched in masses. Uh, that's what I loved about it. I think it's best to watch the case because let's I think it's watch it. 
<laughs> agree to explain the concept. Let's go for it. <laughs> In 2018, the United Nations released an urgent report emphasizing the need to cut carbon emissions in half by 2030 in order to avoid an irreversible climate crisis. The average consumer in Sweden causes around 10 tons of carbon emissions each year, of which 60% is linked to consumption. This spring, the economy took its fight against climate change one step further by adding a premium credit card to its offer. But instead of introducing a premium credit card with the typical benefits that encourages further mass consumption, the economy did the opposite by launching Do Black, the world's first credit card with a carbon limit. Simply put, it's the first credit card ever to stop you from overspending not based on your available funds, but rather on the levels of CO2 emissions caused by your consumption. Do Black helps you track your climate impact and ensures that you reduce it by 50% in line with the UN 2030 recommendation. The core purpose of Do Black is not only the ability to measure the impact of your consumption, but also bringing it to a direct halt making it a radical tool against climate change. For years, credit cards have put a limit on our credit. Do Black puts a limit on our impact. The launch generated thousands of registrations and global media coverage, but more importantly, triggered the conversation around the impact of consumption. The introduction of Do Black was a wake-up call to commercial and financial industries alike and generated an overwhelming interest and willingness to enter an era of greater responsibility. It would seem that putting a carbon impact limit on consumption isn't such a radical concept after all. Perfect examples again. And I think it brings back two things that we talked about. One is a question in the chat that we had from Rihanna, which was, what is the role and responsibility of digital design? Perfect example. And then it's the topic of behavior change, right? This is a perfect example Putting of that. Yeah, I think, I think it's just great, you know, because I, I actually, to your point, it, it really shows the power of digital design because yeah. digital design is actually, you can create new businesses out of it. And and yeah. you know, this is this is a new, new part. It's a new, like, service it's a, it's it's it could be another it could be a business for that matter so um yeah i'm dying to get it because i'm like i would yeah. love to get this you know yeah and if, if it's also if you think about it like if the data is there you can use it with any card you know if pan, if, if people decide or banks decide to use the data uh it's already there and that's what i love about it it's the scalability of this you know yes there is this card that they want to make like but in the end of the day, it's a data play and anyone could use it. I think the financial industry has been a really interesting one in the past couple of years from um, just the, the kind of reputation they have, right? So a lot of these brands are having to think maybe a little bit harder and then some other industries. And, you know, the banking especially, I've seen um, a couple examples originally uh, when this all comes started was um, rounding up your, your spend, for example, 4.95 pounds yeah. being rounded up to five, so the five cents for the charity. And, these kind of little new um, kind of tricks almost. But this is a, a commitment. This is what we talked about in other categories is a true genuine commitment to do something good. And it's it's inevitable that that's part of what, why, why the product exists. In the first exactly. Time. It's done for the greater good. And I also think, you know, it's 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 done, it's to help. It's, it's yes, yeah, a commitment from the bank, but it's also, it's helping me change. You know, it's really hard to change behavior if you don't understand the impact of your day-to-day -day actions, you know? Um, so yeah, that's a great, it's a great one. And I think in a very different, um, just being aware of time as well, in a very different manner, the last uh, piece of work that you also selected has a complete, and we can see some, some similar themes in the ways you were talking about doing good, but also I think it triggers thinking. So, you know, it's behavior change, but it also starts with, being aware of CO2, you know, emissions, but 
um, the most dangerous street um, project was also a perfect example of um, thinking and um, triggering something within the audience's experience of the product, um, which is a huge part of also what, you know, the question was around the power of digital design. Yeah, and, 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 and in this case, you know, that's, that's data triggering emotion and, and actually mm -hmm. like illustrating a problem. I mean, it's actually just, if you really think about it, it's also just a beautiful, beautiful data visualization piece, you know, to take all of the, the shootings in Chicago and, and put it and highlighting it in one street and, and even bringing to life um, some of the victims. And I, I just felt like it was so, and using the red line, which is the, you know, we all know that that's the the danger of the tracker, like it's the point, like this is the, there's so many, it was just conceptually, honestly, very strong. Like that was a, a strong concept, really well executed, um, did the job that it was there to do. And, and was, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we should, yeah, I just absolutely loved it. And is there any topic before we go and, and watch this one as well, um, that you feel would be really interesting to visualize, like you said, that maybe we didn't see in the category? Yeah, I think there are so many things that we Perhaps could. you're not having a solution yet, but it's quite an interesting way to maybe inspire some people who are- I think a lot of the, honestly, a lot of the dialogue that's happening today, if you think about it around, you know, Black Lives Matters and how we're gonna be more diverse. Mm -hmm. And like, this is highlighting an issue like around, you know, gun violence. Um, I think we can, in general, like data provides transparency you know and there's a lot of agencies stepping out being transparent about the diversity data and it ain't pretty like i don't think anyone has great diversity um in their agencies i've not listened enough that i know mm -hmm. and just being able to step forward and say here it is but we're going to commit to action that's the power of data right because you're like so I think any industry can do that. And we can just start looking at this holistically. So if you wanna make a systematic change, which is what the world is calling for, but they is there, it's showing it. We can systematically change and try to improve the data, right? And do it the right way and take the right steps. Um, it's not easy, you know, but we need to understand what steps we need to take and how we take them and where we start. And I think um, to, to your point, like, where it should be. I think that's one of the categories that we need to look into in general and just mm -hmm. like highlight it. Highlight it. Mm -hmm. Let's start with this one um, as a transition and play the video, Alex, on and, and we'll have a little chat afterwards as well. Cool. Thanks. Good morning. Deadly gun violence is surging in Chicago once again. This is with the latest. Good morning, Judy. More than 1,700 people have been shot in the city so far this year. Someone inside that vehicle then opened fire on the world. The deadly outbreak of gun violence has been gripping Chicago. 12-year-old was rushed to the hospital with a gunshot wound to the stomach on Fourth Ave. Gun down in a weekend of violence so typical. Stop interruptions. Gun violence. This morning alone already proving to be much more violent. Party boiled over. Five shot, including a one-year-old girl. At least 51 people have been shot. He told me my son had been shot. And that night, Frankie was shot multiple times. And um, when we got to the um, receptionist area, he told us, um, go to the chapel. Frankie was my dance partner, so I don't dance anymore. And, uh, my cousin was shot, Darren is my second cousin. His father, father. 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 As a born and raised Chicagoan, 
this is something that you should feel. This is the most powerful thing I've seen in Gen Bible. It, it, was, it was overwhelming. To see it here, where we work next door, essentially, um, it's scary. Well, we have hundreds and thousands of people being shot down in Chicago. Really outstanding work um, again, and 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 here. So, bringing the topic of gun violence in Chicago, um, there was uh, several aspects of of the, you know the the project that really um, stood out, which is one of them being the, the updated in real time effect and the immediacy of it, right? Where, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about the impact that that has in terms of and how you know digital design was um, kind of uh, executed in this situation. Yeah. So I think. It's always hard to know exactly how it was executed, but like mm. the fact that you can use real life data and update anything real time is very powerful, which is, you know, obviously something that's at the heart of digital design, you know, mm. being able to do that. But I think what makes this extra powerful is just the fact that they put it into a physical space, you know, they put it out there to the audiences and it's, it's, visually very strong like the way it's executed going back to craft um it's just they could have done it so many different ways think about all the ways you can do this and not have that impact that you have when you decide to put it in one street that you use you decide to use the laser beam like um when you decide to unlock the store you could have decided to do the whole thing online you could have decided to do it like at locations you could have just like there are just so many different ways of doing this but i think the 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 way it was executed and how it all came together and like you say the good morning the immediate response to morning. it is, is um you know being able to do it real time it just kind of came together in in, in a really nice well put together way and the impact of it is very accessible because anyone will feel something, right? And and this is so. And the fact that it's an open space means that you know it brings the audience uh, to pretty much yeah. limits and limited. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Everybody yeah. can go and see it. Everybody can go and interact with it. Uh, it's yeah. there. It's wide in the open. It's a thing that you can accidentally discover. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. You know all of those. And, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, it stops you in your tracks as well. So I think there's something about, um, and this is applicable to, to marketing more generally, right? Where um, it's it's when you're not expecting something to, to kind of occur within your journey or your day to day that it also has more impact. Yeah, and it's also highlighting the issue because it's hard to get the scale unless you put it in one location, right? Yeah. Um, and it would have been really easy to say, we're going to put this where it happened. It doesn't the scale doesn't become us like, oof, you know? Uh, and there was an audience factor in this as well as a like, final point, which is, you know, it's not a consumer as such, but there's a political aspect to this. So senators responding and um, going back to the idea of greater good, um, the audience was actually quite, um, you know, so not that narrow um, and it really uh, tapped into action from quite a broad range of um, you know, actors. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> it's. I think it's always nice when when things like are about driving not only the awareness but actually driving a bigger change, and that's very impactful. But you can't. The, the, yeah, I guess that happened in that case. You're right. That was interesting, uh, but it's so disappointing when it doesn't, isn't it? <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah and actually a lot of times it might not um, yeah it's just a grand plan that might not pick up the yeah. way you expected it <laughs> but, but at the same time it doesn't mean that the work didn't do some, do something and i think you know we i think this is one of those you know if you want to learn something putting things out there and see what happens is, is what we need to do and like in this case it actually had really positive outcomes um mm -hmm. but even highlighting the problem and talking about it and and taking action and making sure that it doesn't go away. Um, yeah. Something that we can do as human beings and, and companies and corporations can do as well. Yeah. 
So that's a great actually final few words to wrap up as well. This was the final uh, piece of work that you handpicked for us today. But any final words I want to, you know, uh, have you share um, anything about the future of the category that you wanted to highlight and, um, you know, piece of wisdom for us to wrap up today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I would just make uh, like a call to all the designers out there um, to like, let's really celebrate craft let's really put it in front of center of the work that we do um and let's make sure that we are designing for a better future and a better world and that we make our clients accountable for it and and we are here you know it's a fantastic place to be because as a designer you can actually have real impact you know and and because we're close to businesses we're we're close to like clients we we understand the audiences we understand the, what the world is asking for we understand you know what kind of actions many brands need to take to be able to to drive positive change for the world and i feel like you know i think i feel like we have kind of a superpower if we manage to apply it right um and a lot of that begins in digital of today because digital is where businesses exist and it's where the data is. And I think also digital is a lot of new businesses are born out of digital. A lot of value propositions are being born out of digital. And a lot of the change that needs to happen needs to happen through digital. So like, yeah, craft and just strive for the for the greater good, you know? No, this is great. And I was really looking forward to having you join because it's such an exciting category as well. Um, driving things forward um so thank you for your time today for that it went by really quickly um so <laughs> straight from iceland and i know you flew in uh you know yesterday or the day before so it was quite a short term um <laughs> turnaround but thank you everyone for joining at home as well i hope you're enjoying the dnad sessions uh, that we have every thursday so we'll see you next thursday for our next category um tune in uh follow some of the links that we'll be sharing uh just our last minute uh to uh the different pieces of work to watch again and yeah let us know what you think and we'll see you all next thursday have a great week <laughs> and thanks for that. Yeah.